Hello and welcome to the Occult Book Review. This edition um, looks at John Spencer's Gifts of the Gods Are UFOs, Alien Visitors or Psychic Phenomena. Before I go into the review, um, on the blog you'll find a new review of Sigil Witchery, um, A Witch's Guide to Crafting Magic Symbols by Laura Tempest Zakroff. And also in the new edition of New Dawn magazine at the end of August you'll find my review of John the Baptist and The Last Gnostics, The Secret History of the Mandines by Andrew Philip Smith. So, to Gifts of the Gods. This book came out in 1994, so it was a bit, of a, a bit ahead of its time when you look at recent books like uh, The Supernatural and uh, books that take the UFO phenomena and compare it to the idea of Kiel's um, kind of super spectrum. So in that way, maybe it's not ahead of its time in that context, but in terms of comparing it to um, UFO culture, I, I think it was simply because of Spencer's open-mindedness. So Spencer interviews a lot of people in this book who've had anomalous encounters. For these people, their lives have been turned upside down. Now, what Spencer asks is, if, if we're gonna say that these people are faking it, uh, their experience didn't really happen, then we should look at what happened to their lives and see if the idea of faking adds up. If a person says they've had an, an, an anomalous encounter and they lose their job, they have a nervous breakdown, they lose their family, they lose their home, they spend their next 10-15 years in an attic painting an image of what they say they've saw over and over again. Does that sound like someone who is looking for attention? Or should we take that person quite seriously? We also need to ask, as Spencer does, is that encounter something that was successful? Or is it something that was a failure? Or is it something that was stumbled upon accidentally with no purpose whatsoever? This is where we separate from um, UFO cultists, I suppose, who see UFOs as something to take us away from where we are and onto some higher plane of existence. This is the exact opposite of the indigenous approach, which is not about elevation, it's about integration. And that integration means accepting that where we are is fine. You know, we're beings of the earth. It doesn't mean that we're, we're separated from a potential extended consciousness realm. It doesn't mean that we don't interact with it. It doesn't mean we don't experience it. But we're not dependent upon it to um, what would I say, separate us from the rest of the world and who we are. I think more and more I'm beginning to accept that folklore archetypes are magical archetypes. Um, mythical archetypes are magical archetypes. Now, from an academic point of view, especially for archaeologists and um, maybe even some skeptical anthropologists, uh, magical archetypes just don't exist. But when we look at books like um, The Holotropic Mind, uh, I could easily of course throw out Joseph Campbell and Jung here, uh, but I won't, um, we can see that archetypes in psychology also propel us forward. So our the people in Spencer's book encountering something that propels them forward and makes them better people. Well, in a lot of cases that's not true, but just like in nature, sometimes there are successes, sometimes there are failures, sometimes a tangent is arrived at unexpectedly. So if someone stumbles upon a place, as some of Spencer's uh, subjects do, they are in so-called haunted houses, uh, so-called ley line energy places, um, UFO hotspots and so on, they have an encounter with some something that changes their lives. It's like some kind of fractal repetition then. For some people it's good, for some people it's bad. If people can't get over it and integrate it and help them take from it and move themselves forward, then we can't really say that was a success. But of course, that brings up the bigger question as to whether this extended consciousness realm was actually intending 
to move someone forward or whether it was just an accidental coming together. If we accept as real then the idea that higher consciousness forms exist and are existing around us on a different vibrational plane to use a kind of new agey term but you know what I'm talking about um, then we also have to take seriously and view differently the notion of taboo which is also something that indigenous people take much more seriously. Taboo places are places where you don't go lightly, you don't settle there, you don't go there alone certainly and you don't disrespect these places. Sometimes they're seen as ancestral places, sometimes they're just known as thin places. They tie in, I think, very uh, well with the idea of fairy wrath or upsetting the good people and so on. What that means is go there unprepared, go there without respecting what that place is and you may well have a very bad encounter just like some of Spencer's subjects probably inadvertently went to these places. Um, also I should mention the geography is very important here but so is so is the, the time of the day, the time of the month, the time of the year and of course even on even longer cycles perhaps that's what that was another function of some of the ancient megalithic monuments which have all the, the so-called magical symbols and sigils uh, etched upon them. Perhaps these were calendars for shamanic interaction and they helped ancient people understand when the right time was to approach these magical forces, these higher psychological forces, without damaging themselves. They were able to integrate, get what they wanted from them. And we know, of course, from ritual practice, uh, ceremony, preparation, that that's not exactly um, new thinking. It, it, it's actually one of the most ancient forms of thinking and preparation. Of course, th that doesn't mean that these forces necessarily have the same type of consciousness that we can, that we, we have. In fact, it may be so abstract that we may not even be able to consider it consciousness. It may simply be a way of behaving, much like Elizabeth um, Ashim, the American radiographer, ended up getting cancer and dying because of her work on x-rays. There was something, there was a counterpart, there was an effect that she wasn't aware of, and it affected her and ultimately killed her. In the same way as people have magical accidents, people have interactions and end up committing suicide, having mental breakdowns because they're not prepared, they don't know, they don't know what they're actually dealing with. Now later on in the book Spencer talks about other effects of this when people begin to believe their own interpretations of what happened as being the only interpretation. They begin to think they speak for certain deities for certain gods for certain spirits they become they have the potential to become cult leaders they begin to think their way is the only way they say that they're they're, chal they're channeling deities they say they're channeling gods and goddesses um if the extent of your spiritual search leads you to believe people like that and to follow them then i don't think you're taking yourself seriously enough. I think it's a terrible ending to an occult search to believe someone like that, to believe someone else's experience is going to be your experience. And so the psychological element of Spencer's work talks about this and at the end of the book he has something interesting to say. Um, I'll just read it out because it's easier. He says, as to solving the UFO mystery of close encounters, and what he's talking about here is all of these encounters. Some are described as UFO encounters, some are described as spiritual encounters, encounters with deity and so on. He says, perhaps there is no solution simply because there is no question. Perhaps the phenomenon is there, like wind and rain and sunshine, to be used as appropriate. If so, then a positive attitude and an open and receptive mind will let us all use it to make us all better people, to build better relationships and ultimately to let us all build a better world. 
Now, what he's talking about there is what I mentioned earlier about people who think you need to use this to get away from yourself, when in fact, it's not about that. The book title is Gifts of the Gods, and it seems that the most healthy way to integrate such a supernatural, so, well, I call it a supernatural experience in the newer context of the word supernatural, um, the healthiest way to integrate it really is to do your best to accept it and make yourself a better person. Um, but I think the most destructive way is to actually say that your way is the only way and to say that what you've experienced is what everyone else experiences. And um, I think that's where the indigenous view separates from the destructive UFO and uh, New Age and Pagan view of the selfishness of the ego. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? It's just people thinking that they've found a way, they speak for a god or goddess, they speak for some new movement. I think that's what we're seeing at the moment. So Spencer's book is a good reminder of what exactly these experiences are. And that is, we just don't know. So thanks for watching and I'll see you again soon. Bye.